Good evening and welcome everybody uh, to this inaugural lecture of Professor Khadija Khorza Shangazi. Um, I'd like to uh, invite you all to please sit down. So welcome particularly to our inaugurating professor, um, but also to her family who are here this evening, her husband, her son, her sister and her nieces and nephews. Welcome to, to you all here today. I also want to welcome all of those colleagues online and I'm very sorry you're not here because you don't get to see the beautiful flowers that have been brought to celebrate this wonderful occasion. So my name is Professor Lynn Morris and I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation here at WITS. And um, I have the great pleasure of welcoming you all today to this very special occasion because inaugural lectures really are very special occasions in the life of a university and of course in the life of the individual inaugurating professor because they really do represent the pinnacle of, of academic excellence and the pinnacle of your career. Um, and we really look forward to hearing more about your research uh, when you deliver your speech. But they all, what it also represents is uh, Khadija is going to be joining Senate. And Senate is the highest decision-making body at this university. Um, it's uh, all the, the, the full professors of this university who make decisions on our policies, our direction, uh, and all the important things. And so I really welcome Khadija also to, to, to the university Senate. So I also would like to introduce the, the, the full uh, procession that you saw walking in. Um, we are accompanied here by the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, Professor Mucha Musemwa who will be delivering the uh, introductory notes. We also have the head of school, uh, Professor Sharon Munsami, the School of Human and Community Development, welcome. Uh, and then we also have, um, this year inaugurating professor that we're going to hear from very shortly. And then we have um, Dr. Munyani Mapozzo, who uh, is a retired uh, senior lecturer uh, from Wits University. So welcome back to Wits. Uh, and she will be delivering the vote of thanks. And so really it just remains for me to say, you know, sit back, enjoy, because these lectures actually are about communicating your, 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 your scholarship uh, to, to, and they're tough lectures to give because it is about uh, professing and it's about talking to a very mixed audience, which of course is what we have here and about professing and about, um, yeah, really a, a celebration of, of, of Khadija's life's work so far, but also about what she's yet to achieve and, and to go on to do here at WITS. So, so thank you all for coming, and um, I will invite the Dean to, to come and address you. A very good afternoon to you all. Um, for those of you who are from the Faculty of Humanities, this very occasion feels very much like an extension of the celebration of research we had yesterday in our faculty. Because indeed, the university is about doing research. It is about producing knowledge. And so we decided yesterday that we were going to celebrate all our researchers who have received awards. And awards that have come out of um, evaluations by other scholars uh, internationally. Um, and so we believe we are a faculty and a university uh, of global note. And today, we are about to demonstrate that as we listen to uh, Prof. Uh, Kozan Shangase. Prof. Kozan Shangase is a well-recognized scientist who is currently, currently ranked third in South Africa, third in Africa, third in BRICS, third in everything, I must say, and 84th in the world in a field by the 2023 World Scientist and University Rankings. She has demonst demonstrable experience in research management, 
supervision and leadership with the leadership of the Vets Preventive Audiology Research Cluster and her chairing of the School of Human and Community Development Research Committee. She completed her undergraduate and postgraduate degrees at Vets, attaining a PhD in 2008 as the first black graduate uh, to receive a PhD in audiology from an African university. As the first black African graduate to receive a PhD, um, she is also the first and to date only black African full professor in a field. She has been a trailblazer throughout her career. She is internationally recognized for her work with over 120 publications to her name, including peer-reviewed journal articles, book chapters, special issues, and co-edited books with a research focus on preventive audiology and the decolonization of knowledge. She is in the top 30 VETS publishers according to the Web of Science for the 15-year period 2008 to 2023, and was recently nominated as an African Academy of Sciences Fellow. Prof. Koza Shangase has played a pivotal leadership role in various organizations and in initiatives, including the Health Professions Council of South Africa, where she has been instrumental in shaping policies, regulations, and standards for the speech, language, and hearing professions. It is now my utmost pleasure to welcome you to deliver your lecture, Prof. Shangas. I have to lift myself. I want to start off by saying good evening, everybody. And thank you so much for taking the time to come and join us this evening on such an important event. It's, it's a very important event in my calendar. Not as important to my son's calendar because for him, what's very important right now is getting ready for his karate grading for black belt. <laughs> Anything else is really just a uh, roll eyes. So thank you for coming. My name is Katija, as I've been introduced. Um, I'm told that this um, inaugural lecture is where you profess your knowledge, um, uh, you know, in the academy. And, uh, but the time that they give you to profess the knowledge is just impossible. So I will be professing a slice, just a slice, of the knowledge that I would love to really share with you. Um, because the time allocation does not really allow anybody to profess the knowledge that they have. Before I start, I want to call upon Abantubagit, Abapilayo, Nabangaseko. These are the people that walk into every space with me, especially in spaces where I find myself feeling a bit unsafe or a bit uncomfortable. So I want to invite them to be comfortable in this space today, since this is my day, I've been told. So the people that I want to recognize here are Ohamisa. Okumete, Omkatin, Shase, Mlilo, Sias Basela, Sias Tim. I want to recognize O Panga Gofa. I want to recognize Abang Telang and Yong, Oshugo, Vula, Galega. I want them to enter the space and feel welcome. 
And I want to say, I am because you were and you continue to be. The next people I want to recognize are my students, my research students. You're being a part of my research space, a space that is very precious to me and a space where I'm most happy and most comfortable is very important to me and it's a valuable, valuable experience. So I want to acknowledge you and I want to say it is the research that we've engaged in that I believe has caused disruption in how audiology is theorized, how audiology is practiced and how audiology is taught. So I want to recognize the students in that slide. Last but not least in this round of um, acknowledgements, I want to recognize all the institutions that are reflected on that slide. And yes, Facebook is there for my mental health. But also most importantly, most of research questions have been raised on Facebook. I have the most brilliant bunch of friends on Facebook who engage with life in the most interesting and most fun way. So I want to recognize them. McDonald's has not done anything for me except create a space that has been a safe space for me to consult with students. We, we have writing sessions at McDonald's purely because it's cheap. It's the only thing we can afford. So McCafe is our thing. I want to recognize that because it is what identifies my research work with my students. But most importantly, I want to recognize the um, Department of Health, national and provincial, because without, without um, facilitation and collaboration with them, none of the research that I, I, I engage in would occur. Health Professions Council of South Africa. That is where my, um, my being was molded. And I want to recognize particularly two individuals who were my colleagues at HPCSA, who continue to be my colleagues long after my term of office there. The first one is Professor Shajila Singh from the Department of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences at, at UCT. I really value her being in my space. The second one who is here today is Dr. Sadna Bolton. Dr. Sadna Bolton is the assistant director of the country's largest speech pathology and audiology department at Chris Honey Baragwanath Hospital, a space that I believe is a center of excellence in the country for our fields. That is in my um, humble, researched, evidence-based opinion. So I want to thank, I want to thank you because these two colleagues, their, um, their involvement in my life lit a fire in me to, to try and emulate what I think they emulate. And that is the deep passion and commitment towards our professions and their demand for service excellence that has the public's best interest at heart all the time, all the time without fail. So I thank you for that. I really thank you for that. And I thank you and I appreciate you. Now I want to um, talk about Uguzwa. What is Uguzwa in Isizul? What is Uguzwa? Uguzwa Okoko. Uguzwa Abalos. That's got nothing to do with the ear. That is somebody who may be a medium who can communicate with the ancestors. Uguzwa. Uguzwa Ikala is to be is attending a court case. It's, it's, it's following uh, court proceedings. It's got nothing to do with it, yeah. Uingane Engezwa. He's a child that doesn't listen, but it's not really about hearing. It's about obedience. It's obedience. Uguzwela. 
to have unembeza, uguzuela, you have feelings, you, you empathize. Again, it's got nothing to do with the ear. Uguzwa emlonyen, or uguzwa ebodwen, to taste in the mouth and to taste in the pot. Nothing to do with the ear, but uguzwa nonetheless. Uguzwa intiziyo, to hear the heart. My, my, my mother's favorite phrase is, I don't, I don't hear your friend in my heart. My instincts are telling me, watch, watch it with this friend. It's got nothing to do with the ear. My favorite one, which is always said about Zulu women specifically, um, they say if a Zulu woman says to you, Ang Zwang. <laughs> They're not saying, I didn't hear you. They're saying, you better run. Because they're about to unleash some beating. So if a Zulu-speaking woman says, Anzwang, it's got nothing to do with the ear. So, Uguzwa, in Isi Zulu, Ulim Lamengalina does not only mean hearing. I use this example to illustrate how in an African language, such as Isi Zulu, the term can have many meanings which have implications for audiology in an African context. The term uguzwa in Isizul can indeed be translated as hearing. However, it's important to note that languages and their meanings are deeply rooted in cultural contexts, and just purely translating does not capture, cannot capture the full nuance of the term. While I was inviting friends to come to this uh, inaugural lecture, the main question that I kept being asked was, they were not asking if they'll be able to hear me. They, their hearing is fine. They were asking if they would be able to access the information. Will they be able to understand what I'll be saying? A friend of mine from Etewin, Nomfundo Peta, says specifically, Katija, will, it be, will your lecture be too academic? Will it be too technical? And that's what they were saying when they were saying, it had nothing to do with their hearing. It has everything to do with access to information. So this is also very consistent, um, a, a very consistent reminder that I always get from a colleague that I really highly respect and love, who is in the audience today, where is Tlali? Dr. Mutlali Pula. She always, Dr. Mutlali Pula Nata Netaulela, always stresses the importance of translating our research into knowledge that is accessible. Knowledge that is accessible to the general public, which I call the art of science communication. Uluazi oluzwagalai. Do you see what I just did there? Uluazi oluzwagalai. Dr. Tlale um, wrote a... Uh, um, a provocative chapter in our award-winning book, Black Academic Voices, The South African Experience, a book that I co-edited with my forces within the academy, Professor Grace Kuno, Professor Edith Paswana, and Prof. Hugo Canham. Her chapter describes how, as black women academics, we are sitting on one bum in the academy, which is loosely translated from Isizulu, meaning Sihleli Ngesing Esisod. Now, if you know Isizulu and you translate Sihleli Ngesinga Isisoto into sitting on one bum, it, you lose a lot of meaning in between that. Nonetheless, she says that because we're sitting on one bum, we better make it count. We better make it count. So, um, as earlier illustrated within the African context, using Isizulu speaking communities as my, as my positionality allows, the concept of hearing goes beyond the simple act of perceiving sound. It encompasses a broader understanding of listening, understanding and engaging with the environment and the people around you, as well as those that have departed, Amadlus. When the Amazulu king, Isilo Samabandla, or Misuzulu Gazulitin, uttered the phrase that I use in my title today, he was highlighting a very important definition of uguzwa in Isizul. That of practicing the art of discernment. When hearing something, hear it, but do not necessarily listen to what is being said. 
This is a deliberate act of critically engaging with information or knowledge, not just accepting information or as fact, or accepting it as appropriate for your context. This critical engagement with knowledge and practice automatically leads to one defying power and questioning the accepted or the, or the um, endorsed knowers, those that, are, that know, lab to our bias. So, and it leads to one fighting to insert other voices in spaces where they have traditionally been excluded or in spaces sitting on one bum. This is in fact what all the authors in our book, Black Academic Voices, a South African Experience, were aiming to do. They introduced a, a different voice, formulate new theories, express and share different narratives, and this towards fostering practice that embraces diversity, not practice that simply tolerates diversity. Practice that embraces diversity. Published evidence has shown us that our knowledge base and consequently our practice is influenced by what is called epistemological racism. Obviously, um, Epistemological racism in this case means we are heavily dependent or reliant on Euro-American centric knowledge and practice. This is defined, of course, by those factors that I've, I've put there, geographic location, racial diversity, gender, led by language. The fact that you cannot publish in your an audiology paper in Isizulu means I have to change what I'm saying in order to fit in with the English language. Geographic location, they say that studies that are, are, are published anywhere outside of the Eurocentric space are less likely to be published, easily published. Racial diversity, they say studies that are, are, are submitted by black scholars are less likely to be accepted than their white counterparts. Gender, research shows that studies that are submitted by males are more likely to be accepted than studies that are, accepted by, by, are, 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 sub, are submitted by uh, females because men are trusted more than women. Women make up things. So when considering audiology in the African context, it's therefore very important that we must consider all these nuances and all these in, in influences. This is particularly important because in the Lancet, um, um, th that issue in 2018, which is my favorite issue of the Lancet, it covers the influence of language and culture in healthcare. And essentially, that, that, th the quote that I put up there says that people that belong to the less dominant, cult uh, dominant group in any context have less favorable health outcomes than those that belong in the dominant um, group. Also people that their language and culture is not considered in the conceptualization and the implementation of any healthcare initiative, they benefit less from the health intervention than those in the dominant, um, in the dominant grouping. So this for me is my passion. It's important that when you're, when you're practicing within the African context, you consider all of these things because they do have implications for number one, how people seek health, health seeking behavior. Number two, how people adhere to the treatment plans that you give them. How you uh, consider language and culture in your planning goes a long way. There are obviously implications, for example, if you ignore or disregard the broader cultural understanding of the word uguzwa. Um, my very favorite collaborator who is here today and who has the, 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 the vote of thanks gig this evening, Dr. Muposho, and myself, we argue that ignoring culture, such as in this case of um, the cultural understanding of uguzwa in preventive audiology provision, can lead to incomplete assessments, miscommunication, limited treatment options, psychological impacts, and reduced engagement with audiological services. For an example, in, in, in a case where a patient walks in and says, I hear tinnitus, 
which is ringing in their ears, and my ears get full. And, and, and an audiologist tests without considering the possible African um, explanations for what is going on, might come out and say, there's no tinnitus, there's no evidence of eustachian tube dysfunction, there's no evidence of a middle ear infection, and might even go further and say, this patient is malingering. Malingering is a fancy term that we use to mean that somebody is faking an illness or faking uh, whatever disorder. Now, if I give you an example of somebody that's that ozwa abalozi, somebody ozwa or koko ozwa abalozi, the medium, often before they start communicating with their ancestors, they hear tinnitus. Often their hearing can get muffled because the explanation is that the ancestors are blocking them from inter in, in interacting with any other noises or any other sounds but the messages that they're wanting to transmit. Now, if you're, not, if you're not aware of that explanation, you will not probe for it in your case history, and you certainly are not going to consider it in your diagnosis and in your management plan. So, these implications are awful when we consider hearing loss in numbers. Projections that we have, um, based on the estimates released by the World Health Organization, indicates that a really, really large number of individuals in the world globally um, suffer from disabling hearing loss, and these numbers are set to increase. Right now, about 6% of the world's population lives with a disabling hearing loss. And of that 6%, 93% are adults and 7% are children. And of those, a significant number, about 90%, are in low and middle income countries where we are located. Only 10% is in the rich, high income countries. And of the 90% in the low and middle income countries, a big, a significant number of those come from Sub-Saharan Africa, where we are. So it's important that we realize the significance of the problem and so have proper plans in place to either mitigate the problem or how we're going to treat it when it's identified. These numbers obviously do not um, consider, sorry, they don't consider the impact of um, pandemics such as what we saw with COVID. Similarly, in our context, specifically in South Africa, which is considered the epicenter of HIV AIDS, these numbers don't consider the influence of HIV AIDS and, and TB um, in, in, in how hearing loss presents in our context. Hearing loss is caused by various, various uh, causes. Um, and today, I'm going to touch literally on just four that um, are the major, four major ear and hearing burdens of diseases within the South African context. The first one is um, early childhood hearing impairment, um, which we really want to eradicate um, because it's got serious implications. This is what, what has uh, prompted the global, uh, um, global move of doing what's called EDI, Early Hearing Detection and Intervention, EDI. The second one is ototoxicity. Ototoxicity is a hearing loss that is, is caused by some treatments that we take. Those treatments, those drugs can, can, can cause damage to the ear, okay? The third one is noise-induced hearing loss. And I'm specifically here talking about occupational noise-induced hearing loss. I'm not talking about clubbing. I'm not talking about you going to the club. Uh, that will damage your hearing, but today's lecture, I'm only talking about people that, that, that are exposed to noise at work um, and, and then develop a, a hearing loss. And the last cause, major cause of hearing loss within the South African context are middle ear diseases, which, which often people just call ear infections. Now, all of these are preventable. Majority of them, in fact, are preventable. We need to have proper plans in place that are anticipatory to make sure that we, 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 we prevent the hearing loss from occurring. What I'm going to do is talk about what we know, just generally, what we know about each of these um, and compare that to the global standards. And then I'm gonna talk about what are the challenges? So 
what's the problem with us? Why aren't we able to do something about this? And then I'm going to suggest recommendations for what should be done. Okay. So in my context analysis, that's what I'm going to cover. Preventive audiology falls within preventive health care, and there's no argument about the importance or, or the value of prevent, preventive care. In that slide, you see the different levels of prevention that are available, and audiology falls under all of those areas. Primordial is what I really want to focus on, um, because I believe that if our country had to focus their prevention uh, strategies at, at the primordial level, a lot of the challenges that we're facing would go away. However, it's actually the most difficult one to address. Primordial uh, level of prevention is where you prevent, you create conditions that make, make it impossible for risk factors to uh, come up and cause problems. So uh, one of the key things that can be done at primordial level of prevention is what's called attending or enhancing social determinants of health. So what are social determinants of health? Social determinants of health are the circumstances which people are born, circumstances in which people grow up, circumstances in which people live, work, age, and the systems that are put in place to deal with illness. So when people in this country are toy-toying about housing, or they're toy-toying about health, or they're toy-toying about access to food, or they're toy-toying, to me, as an audiologist who's pushing a preventive audiology agenda, I hear them um, toy-toying about primordial prevention level. Because if the circumstances where people, in which people are born, grow up, live, work, age, and the systems put in place to deal with illness, if those are enhanced, a lot of our problems will be eradicated. So for me, that's a very important level. The last level, quaternary, quaternary uh, uh, prevention, audiology is not involved in that really. And it was actually the first time where I saw, um, during COVID, where I saw it in action. It's described as where you have to um, have measures in place to prevent problems that a prevention strategy is causing. So, for example, in COVID, if vaccines that have not been proven to be effective are used to prevent the uh, spread of, of COVID, the problems that then occur because of the vaccines need to be prevented, and that's what happens at quaternary um, level of care. Most of the audiology studies which I talk about today fall under the primary, secondary, and tertiary level of care. This slide I had to include because when I was, when I was writing a chapter that talks about exactly the levels of care, but in much more detail than what I just did now, um, I, I, I got so frustrated and I started talking to one of my housemates um, who's my husband, um, and I said to him, I have all this information and I need to capture it visually for my visual learners. Um, he obviously put on his um, accounting hat and, and, and came up with this figure, which I think is beautiful. Um, and, and, and he was paid in kind, and he also... Um, <laughs> He also then got obviously published as an illustrator. So, you know, when they say married in community of property. <laughs> right. Okay, so what do we know about the four areas that I spoke about earlier? What do we know? Okay. About early childhood um, hearing impairment, globally, it is known, it is said that we must, all babies that are born, all babies that are born, must have their hearing screened by one month of age. By three months of age, we must know what the baby's hearing is. If there's a hearing problem, we must know the severity of the hearing problem. By six months of age, the baby, if the baby was found to have a hearing problem, the baby must be in intervention already. This is called the 136 principle. This is what the global standard is. What happens in our country? A completely different, different space. 
we are not able to screen all babies that are born by one month, or we, we, we actually even by five years. We're not able to implement um, early hearing detection in this country, not yet. But a lot of progress has been made. There's a lot of focus currently on intervening when the problem is already there, not on preventing it from occurring. So you will find uh, babies that are already diagnosed with a hearing loss and then they fitted with hearing aids. But even that, in terms of fitting with hearing aids or accessing cochlear implants, the resources are so restricted or constrained that we're not even passing in that aspect. So we're not meeting the 136 principle at all. As far as ototoxicity is, is, um, is concerned, this is the drug-induced hearing loss. Globally, it is said every patient that is put on treatment that is possibly toxic to the ear needs to be placed in an ototoxicity monitoring program. And the ototoxicity monitoring program means the patient must be tested before they start the treatment and then monitored regularly so that should there be any change in their hearing function, something can be done to prevent it from getting worse. And there are lots of interventions that can be done. These drugs are drugs, for example, mainly that are used for TB treatment, but you find them um, in some cancer, ca cancer medications, uh, some antidepressants, some anti-anxiety medications. Um, they cause a person to have tinnitus, which is ringing in their ears. They can have fullness in their ear, and, and sometimes they can have uh, balance problems. So these, this, this, we are behind when it comes to actually doing this. We are unable to meet the standard. Noise-induced hearing loss, another uh, major, major problem in our country. At the moment, minds seem to be making strides towards the prevention of hearing loss, although they are far from meeting the global standards. Manufacturing and construction companies are not, nowhere near um, doing that. And the problem is, the global standard is that all industries where machinery is used must buy quiet. It's called buying quiet. Buying quiet means buy machines that don't make noise that is hazardous to the ear. But those machines are very expensive. And so my, mine owners and what have you, people don't want to spend money because quality of life is less important than um, the bottom line. So we are far behind with this. What they tend to do is they push one of the measures of preventing uh, occupational noise-induced hearing loss, which is using hearing protection devices. So you will see minors walking around with, with uh, earmuffs in their ears. That is like one of the last um, resorts that are recommended globally. Buying quiet is first. But that's where we are. Even though our country does have the Mine Health and Safety Act of 1996 in place, challenges persist. As far as middle ear pathology is concerned, whoa, we are very, very far behind. There is no preventive uh, strategy in place. There's literally just treatment. When the, when the patient is presenting with an oozing ear, then they treat it, and then they have chronic ear, then they go for surgery. But there's no preventive strategy in place. Now, if we're saying that these four conditions are preventable and we're slacking so badly in managing them, it is such a pity. So what is the problem? Why are we failing so badly? We're failing so badly because of numerous factors, numerous factors. But the biggest one is regulatory hurdles. We have rules and regulations in place. We have guidelines in place, but there is no regulatory enforcement. There is no accountability. Um, if the mine is not implementing a hearing conservation program, there is no stick to punish them. If the hospital does not test any of the babies that are born, or even babies that are in NICU, which, which are risky babies, nothing happens. The second one, of course, is the burden of diseases. Within our country, where we have what's called quadruple burden of disease, HIV, AIDS, and TB, influence significantly what audiologists are able to do. 
Almost everything that we do in audiology is influenced significantly by HIV AIDS. So because we are the epicenter of HIV AIDS, all conditions that we're trying to, to manage or all interventions that we're wanting to implement, if they don't consider that, they will fall flat. Access barriers, obviously. Resource constraints, there's like hardly any audiologist. If you see that slide, there's like one audiologist for three, five million people, like literally. And most of those audiologists, 90% of the audiologists speak only English or Afrikaans. So this, this has huge implications for, 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 for service delivery within our context. Awareness gap, a lot of people don't know the things that I'm talking about now. Just the general public, but also healthcare practitioners often don't know that I should be referring this person for auto toxicity monitoring once I've, I've prescribed this medication. They don't, right? Mine workers don't know that if they're exposed to noise levels above 85 decibels for eight hours straight, they can actually sue. They don't know that. And now, with this lecture, I'm hoping some mind is going to, some mind worker is going to hear me and they're going to walk around the mine with their phone and put it on, on that app that measures the sound levels, sound levels and actually start making money by suing. <laughs> Diagnostic capacity, we, we, we're struggling with equipment. We don't have a lot of equipment available to do the work. One of the key, key challenges that makes it almost impossible for, our, for us to do the work that we want to do in terms of preventive audiology is the lack of a proper data capturing and data management system within the healthcare sector in the country. A data management system that recognizes that our healthcare is a migration prone healthcare. Our patients move around. They go from this hospital to that hospital. They go from this province to that province. Now, if, if that person is undergoing autotoxicity monitoring and you're testing them today and they have to come back in three months so that you can monitor and check, compare the results. Now they're in, in KZN, but this, you are capturing all your notes on paper in your file. They go to KZN and there's no, there's no tracking that can happen because we don't have a, a, a unified data capturing and management system that works, that recognizes that we are within a context that is migration prone. With specifically um, regards to order, so this, you know, I've attended some um, inaugural lectures uh, previously, and people put slides like this, right, to show that I've published, right, I'm not talking just from <laughs> whatever. So you can see that um, the, 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 the presentation is based on evidence, right? So, so that's, that's there for you, for you to see. The important one, which I've underlined in red there, is that within our context, HIV AIDS, I said, creates lots of challenges. In, in um, one of the studies that we've just, just published, shows that it's not just HIV infection in neonates that cause in babies, that, 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 that is a risk factor for hearing loss, but HIV exposure, not infection, increases the risk of a hearing impairment. Now imagine the implications of that in our context. Imagine the implications of that for the audiologist working at Barra, who now has to have an, a, 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 a screening program in an HIV clinic for babies and not just for the parents. And not just for babies that are HIV positive, but babies that were exposed, not infected. So the implications are huge, okay? Specific to autotoxicity, those are some of the challenges that we face. Monitoring gaps, here I wanted to talk about the case of Montabello um, Hospital, which is in Enduit, right? This here is an example of how the most rural of the rural, the most poor of the poor, were able to revolutionize the management of TB patients in this country. Because in Montebello, 123 patients went deaf because they were being treated for TB and they were not on autotoxicity monitoring. And they made a noise and it was all over. And it's only then that the Department of Health took notice and changed the protocols that are followed for TB management in terms of making sure that all the patients that are under TB treatment get, um, get monitored. So I want people to learn from uh, Montebello. 
and know that um, there's a lot that you can do even when you think your voice is little. And we did it. Everybody else can. Specific to uh, occupational noise-induced hearing loss, also there are challenges. Oh, that was another flex, right? <laughs> um, so in occupational noise-induced hearing loss, there, there are challenges as well. The challenges there are your monitoring deficits, your infrastructure, inadequate and ineffective hearing conservation programs. They literally have no systematic plan in place to ensure that all workers that are exposed to noise above 85 decibels for eight hours straight are monitored, their hearing is, pro is protected, and the noise levels within the place are monitored. There is no system in place. The mines have done really great, um, not great, but they've done better than the manufacturing and construction companies. So we have evidence to prove all of that, right? As far as the middle ear, um, middle ear infections are concerned, the biggest, the biggest complexity and challenge is the fact that middle ear, middle ear infections, by their very nature, they're recurrent in nature. So they, they, they repeat. If your child has had an ear infection, they get it again, they get it again, they get it. So it's very difficult to prevent it. But one key preventive strategy that's been written about all, all, over and over again is again going back to what I spoke about earlier addressing the social determinants of health. Because the, the social determinants of health are the leading cause of middle ear pathology, especially in children. So again, if the government makes sure that the conditions under which people are born, live, grow up, die, whatever, are good, middle ear infections can be prevented. So what must we do? What must be done? Okay, there's lots that can be done. I thought about this very carefully. But because of time, I'm just going to focus on, on certain ones. Can you see? Can you see this is proof I did a lot of work. I'm going to publish this, and then you can read it in your own leisure. But these are some of, um, of the solutions that I want to advance. The first one is regulatory um, enhancement. Obviously, political will has to be there. For any of this to work, there has to be political will. Government support, regulatory oversight, and collaboration are essential for any of the effective preventive audiology in any of the four areas I've spoken about to work. One has to think about the carrot versus stick approach here. Capacity building, obviously we need uh, to increase the number of trained audiologists. Task shifting, because we don't have enough audiologists now and it's going to take forever to get enough audiologists, we, 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 we recommend what's called task shifting. So there are certain tasks that audiologists do that can be done by a trained community healthcare worker or by a trained volunteer. Um, and so they'd be able to do the work uh, under the supervision of the audiologist. Teleaudiology is where I am located in, in Joburg and I can supervise a, a, a community healthcare worker and do it to be able to do um, an autotoxicity auto monitoring program. I'm able to supervise them via the use of ICT. That's a huge thing. It works, and it's worked in most countries. We're taking very slowly to, to adopt it um, in our context, and this is the context that really, really needs it. Clinical guidelines, we need to establish clinical guidelines. Obviously, clinical guidelines, um, can only work if there's regulatory enforcement. We can develop as many clinical guidelines as we want. Dr. Balton and myself sat on the HPCSA when most of these clinical guidelines were developed. But the clinical guidelines are not going to uh, be implemented if there's no regulation that says do it. You have to do it. And that all goes back to um, political will. Advocacy and awareness. Obviously, education campaigns, patient empowerment, these are important recommendations that I think need to be, need to be considered. We need to address the data management, uh, um, data management problem that I raised earlier. Obviously, research and data collection to allow us to have evidence that is um, contextually relevant, evidence that is contextually responsive, and evidence that is contextually responsible. Okay, so basically we're arguing for uh, Afrocentric 
evidence base that will allow us to implement interventions that work. Okay, I've spoken about guidelines. As far as the um, EDI is concerned within the South African context, we just need to expand what we currently are doing. Um, and there's a lot of work has been done in those contexts. There's a lot of, um, um, there's a big difference between what's happening in private practice when you compare it to um, private. Uh, so we need, to, we, need to, we need to bridge that divide and make sure that all our babies get the intervention that they require, regardless of their social class, their economic standing. Okay, as far as autotoxicity is concerned, medication alterna alternatives are important. At this point in time, most of the time medications are decided upon based on cost, based on also, the, well obviously the most important one is life sustaining, saving a life right but without considering the quality of that saved life the 123 patients from montebello were happy that they didn't have tb but they were miserable that they were now completely deaf completely deaf so you sustain a life but you don't worry about the quality of that life after you've sustained it so it's very important that we we, 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 we sapra talks about or considers medication alternatives that are not just um linked to uh, costs, right? So capacity, I always argue about risk versus benefit debates. That's what needs to be happening here. Surveillance and reporting, I want the public to go report. If you started on medication and suddenly you have ringing in your ears and you didn't have it before, report it. Report it as a side effect. You suddenly are dizzy, report it. But we tend to just think, ah, oh, you know, I'm not well. Yes, you're not well, but now you have another symptom that you didn't have before. So it means that it's a side effect of the medication reported. So we can have proper surveillance data and we're able to make decisions that are um, driven by evidence. Okay. Specific to occupational noise induced hearing loss, we need to invest in infrastructure. Hearing conservation programs need to be up and running and they need to be regulated. Workplace audits need to happen and I want the mine workers, I want the construction workers to be part of this audit and carry their phones and record the noise levels and sue. Technological solutions are very important. I want to just uh, focus on that a little bit. Um, predictive noise monitoring using artificial intelligence and machine learning is what would resolve a lot of the challenges that we have, including, including the fact that we don't have manpower to be able to do the work. This is the work that is um, um, spearheaded by Milka and John. I saw them earlier. Milka um, is in mining engineering and John is in electrical and information engineering. They are working with us in terms of using applications of ma machine learning um, algorithms to estimate mine workers' hearing loss in South African mine, uh, platinum mines, and introducing proactive measures to prevent hearing loss from occurring. For example, one of the very recent papers that um, we submitted, okay, um, looks at the mine workers wearing a watch that they, they wear the watch and they walk around wherever they're working, but if the noise level, wherever they're located, suddenly is suddenly louder than what it's supposed to, first of all, the watch will vibrate and alert the miner that watch it, you're about to. And so they can wear the hearing protection, make sure that they, their hearing is not damaged. But at the same time, the watch sends a signal to their supervisor to say this is happening. So this is really, proactive and it makes sure that we don't, we're not, we're not picking up problems but to prevent them from occurring. So I'm really excited about the work that these two colleagues um, from engineering are doing because I think it's going to um, have a huge uh, impact on how occupational noise induced hearing loss can be prevented. Not clubbing. Clubbing is you on your own. <laughs> okay. Specific to middle ear, middle ear diseases, we need to have sensitive measures that pick up the problem before it actually occurs. 
Dr. Sibotoma works, this is his passion, uh, middle ear assessment and uh, objective measures that can pick up a problem long before it becomes a significant problem that requires surgery. Um, so we 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 on the right track there, and hopefully we can have political will for these fancy sensitive measures to be bought for hospitals everywhere, and they're not just in the in the research lab, which which currently they are, they're in the research lab, they're in in in, in Dr. Sibotoma's lab. Okay, can you see that slide says what? Zengia dead. I'm almost done. Okay. Preventive audiology in South Africa is multifaceted. So the four conditions that I spoke about um, uh, 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 raise a lot of challenges. Even though the challenges are about tailored solutions, regulatory enhancement, teleaudiology, collaboration, and continuous monitoring hold promise for mitigating the, the burden of hearing impairment that I've just spoken about. A comprehensive and a contextually relevant approach is crucial for achieving successful preventive audiology outcomes. By focusing on these four conditions, a lot can be done to reduce the burden of um, hearing impairment and improve the overall health, hearing health of the South African population. Limited resources, inadequate infrastructure, epistemological racism that I spoke about earlier, and social disparities often create a power imbalance um, in healthcare provision and practice, including in ear and hearing care. This power imbalance can hinder access to effective audiological services and perpetuate inequalities. Defying this power dynamic is crucial. In the context of preventive audiology, defying power involves planning and implementing services having considered linguistic and cultural diversity of the people receiving the services, empowering individuals, families and communities, leveraging on technology, strengthening healthcare systems to overcome the barriers and the challenges that I spoke about earlier. Most importantly, which is my plea in today's lecture, defying power urges the general public to learn from the people of Induid and the miners in the silicosis class action where they sued the mines even though they got paid long, when long after they, di they died, but they sued the mine and the mines now have better uh, uh, preventive measures in place for, for silicosis. If something similar can happen for hearing impairment, I don't know what would happen. So my plea today is that the general public must please learn from the people of Induid. If you're a mother, a young mother, or well, old mother, but of a <coughs> young baby, you must demand the 136 principle for your baby. Demand it. If you're working in a noisy place, demand that you are in, an, in, a, in a hearing conservation program. If you're on medication that is possibly autotoxic in nature, demand that you are in an autotoxicity monitoring program. It's only if you demand these that the power dynamics can change and favor you, and you, you then benefit from the preventive audiology initiatives. Defying power also requires collaboration and partnerships amongst various stakeholders. If we all do this, and the general public specifically demands all of the things that I'm requesting them to do, then it would mean that contextual relevance, contextual responsiveness, and contextual responsibility for us means sibezwe, kodwa, singabalaleli. Of course, none of the evidence that I've shared today would have been at all available had it not been for uh, the blessers that you see on this screen. <laughs> so here, uh, it's, it's the people that have funded, uh, provided funding for all the research that we do. These organizations have played a really significant part in, in getting me where I am right now. You see the National Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences is located in the center and most prominently because, yo, they supported me. 
They didn't only support me financially, but they supported me in ways that I cannot even describe. And this is under the former CEO, um, Professor Sarah Musuetsi. Professor Sarah literally stopped me from packing up and leaving the academy. So I want to acknowledge these, these um, organizations for having supported all the work that we do. These three key individuals, my journey would not be complete if I didn't mention their names and I didn't acknowledge their impact in the work or in the journey that I've, I, I've taken up until now. Professor Emeritus Peter Cooper, he's here, I saw him. He's from Pediatrics and Child Health at Charlotte Matlake Johannesburg Academic Hospital. Professor Cooper took an interest in me as a young clinician at his newborn follow-up clinic at, at the then Jobek Jen Hospital and demanded excellence. He demanded evidence-based practice in how his pediatric patients were assessed and treated. Prof would invite me to give journal club talks in his uh, department. Um, and all of this cultivated a, 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 an interest in research for me. And it also highlighted for me how important best practice is. Prof is also the very first person to successfully motivate for me to obtain funding towards my masters. And I would not have registered for my master's had Prof Cooper not uh, given me funding from a pediatric fund and my master's was in adults. Um, that's how appreciative I am of how he supported me to get here and I will never forget that. Most recently, um, see now you wanting me to make me cry. Most recently, Prof. Cooper served as one of the endorsers for one of our books, Early Detection and Intervention in Audiology. You know, an endorser is a person that reads the book and then they write a blurb that gets put in, in the, back of the back cover of the book. Prof. Prof. Cooper did that. And this is what he wrote in the back cover of the book. And, and, and it, was, it just represented pure generosity on steroids for me. This is what he said. The scope and breadth of this research is extremely impressive, and importantly, it's evidence-based. It deals with the practicalities on the ground rather than the ideal. I recommend it wholeheartedly. And that's exactly what we wanted the book to do. And he picked all of that up, and I thank him for that. At the same time, while Prof. Cooper was cooking me, the late Professor Lorna Jacklin, also from the Pediatrics and Child Health at Charlotte McGregor Johannesburg Academic Hospital, stepped up and nurtured me and um, um, saw this interest that I had in early intervention. He, she also started inviting me to be part of her early intervention clinics at the then called TMI, Neurodevelopmental Clinics, and she would invite me also to present at workshops and conferences. And then she made me part of the lecturing cohort for her master's program in early childhood neurodevelopment. That's when I knew, I knew, if people see something in you, it means there's something. It means there's something that you need, to, you need to cultivate. So I thank you, profs, from the bottom of my heart. Last but not least, on that slide, as Professor Eleanor Ross. Oh. Professor Ross is a former professor of social work at WITS. She is now a visiting professor at the Center for Social Development in Africa, which is based at UJ. Professor Ross took me on as a master's student and as a PhD student in a field that is not hers. She's in social work. It had nothing to do with audiology. But she took me on because there was no one available or who made themselves available to supervise me in my field. And so what Professor Ross did for me can never be undone. I thank her for that. 
Last but not least, on this slide. Oh, I'm, I'm done with Professor Ross. <laughs> <laughs> You see, it's because I was crying. It's because I'm busy crying now. Okay, so you see now we have chocolates. <laughs> and we have cappuccino. Those that know me well know that this, is now, this now means I'm done. And this is now, I'm happy. I'm now in a happy space. So here, I want to thank my colleagues from across the academy. The ones who have supported me and have been a soft spot for me to land on at various points in my career including one of my former heads of schools um, right at the beginning of my, of my joining WITS, um, the academy, Professor Norman Duncan. Professor Norman Duncan is a professor emeritus at the University of Pretoria and currently visiting professor in our school, School of Human and Community Development. I'm now outing um, uh, Professor Duncan because he features in my chapter in the book, Black Academic Voices, the South African Experience. He features as having provided me with the kind of leadership that I strongly believe any young academic needs to survive and thrive in the academy. I thank you colleagues for that. I want to thank my colleagues from the School of Human and Community Development here today, led by my head of school, Professor Sharon Munsami. I thank you for holding me and being here to support me. My friends, including my virtual friends, but they're just as dear as all my friends. Thank you, Banganban. Gyabong. My family, I love you. Gintanda gintlizoyam yonke. Gintanda zutu ala anipe yonke inte nifunayo. Nemali eni. To our son, who I call O because I respect the Poppy Act, <laughs> I want to say good luck to you on your upcoming black belt grading. I want to say, may you dish out really, really, really good beatings <laughs> to another woman's son with absolute dignity and discipline and take those same beatings back because they will be dished out to you with even more dignity and discipline. Just don't break a leg this time, please. Lastly, thank you to everybody who is physically here. I really appreciate you. And I thank everybody who is joining us online. Thank you. And I want to say shout out to my people, Enyo Kasela. I love. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is no doubt your moment. It's your moment. Prof, this was more than just a rite of passage. You've now arrived in the academy. Welcome.
I will not try to abridge your lecture by commenting too much on it. Safe to say, as I said there, to use a phrase of yours, I was feasting on your symphony of ideas. It was well put, clearly embedded in those words you started off with. I learned a lot about the meaning of words, the hidden, the visible, you demonstrated to us. But the way you use those words to demonstrate how it is important for us as scholars, particularly scholars in the Faculty of Humanities and Humanities elsewhere, and indeed the social sciences, that we must constantly remind ourselves of our mission in life, our academic mission, our intellectual mission, which is to defy power, speak truth to power. But we can do that if we don't listen to the voices of the people of Montebello, for example, the people of Soweto, you name it. Because these are the people we should be writing about because we must engage, as you reminded us, in engaged scholarship. They provide us with the context. We can theorize and theorize, but at the end of the day, without those experiences, I don't think we can really produce the kind of knowledge that you are now using to say this is the only way we can challenge received wisdom, particularly received wisdom from the global north. Methods from the south is exactly what you shared with us. Knowledge from the south is exactly what you shared with us today. So thank you very much for a stimulating lecture, reminding us of what we should be doing as humanities scholars. Thank you very much. It is once again my singular honor to um, invite Dr. Munyane Mposho to give a, a vote of thanks. But before you, you do that, Dr. Mposho, I just want to say something about you, if you allow me. Dr. Munyane Mposho, PhD, is a retired former senior lecturer in the Department of Speech Pathology at the University of Witwatersrand. She served as a lecturer at, at the University of Pretoria Center for Augmentative and Alternative Communication before joining VETS in February 2004. She's a former member of the Health Professions Council of South Africa, um, particularly its board, right? Not just a member, but also a member of its board. She has served in significant leadership roles in the speech, language, and hearing professions. She received funding from the Tutuka Research Fund from the National Research Foundation and from the National Institute of Social Sciences African Pathways, uh, African Pathways Program, which included guest lecturing at the University of Ghana's Department of Speech, Language, Pathology in Accra, in 2017, she was invited to be a guest lecturer on service learning to master students in speech pathology at St. John's University in the, uh, in the USA. She was a member of the JET Education Services Consortium of Inclusive Education Experts, Sisonke Inclusive Education Pilot Project in 2005. She has taught on academic service learning and augmentative and alternative communication and supervised undergraduate and postgraduate students in clinical training and research. She has, she has published numerous peer-reviewed journal articles, technical and research reports, both chapters and co-edited books, and she has presented in both local and international congresses over the years. Dr. Mposho has been 
Professor Koza Nshangase's collaborator, mentor, staunch supporter, and a stead steadfast, soft spot to land on. Dr. Mposho, please come forward and make your remarks. Sanbonani, Jimelang. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, all protocol observed. This is a term that I normally hear is popularly used. It means I honor you, the people in front here, the, the important people, the head of school and the dean and everyone. So protocol observed. And to the family, the friends that are here, uh, we honor you. Thank you for coming. So my role is to really, I'm being sent. <laughs> to, <me> mean, <laughs> to do the bunch of things. And before I do it, I really want to say uh, I enjoyed your presentation. You reminded me of what Maya Angela says, that you are not alone. Wear that crown, Katija, wear it well, because it's been paid for by blood and sweat. Okay, today we stand at the cusp of inspiration, united by the radiant light of knowledge and the profound impact it can have on our world. It is with a heartfelt of appreciation that I address you on this momentous occasion where we gather to honor the brilliance of a true luminary, our esteemed friend and my former colleague, <laughs> Professor Koza Shangazi. In the presence of visionaries like you, this inaugural lecture titled Nibezwe, Defying Power Towards Preventive Audiology, takes on a new and remarkable significance. Your choice to join us here today elevates this discourse to unparalleled heights, infusing it with the power to transform lives and reshape our perceptions. Let us extend our gratitude to Professor Koza Shangase, who has not merely delivered a lecture, but has gifted us with a symphony of wisdom, as the dean just said, insight and responsibility. Through her expertise and unwavering dedication to the field of preventive audiology, she has unveiled pathways to knowledge that not only resonate deeply, but also honor the tapestry of our South African heritage. As we bask in the glory of this event, let us not forget the hands that toiled tirelessly behind the scenes, our colleagues and collaborators, your dedication to meticulous planning and seamless execution has set the stage for this grand spectacle of enlightenment. To the remarkable audience before me, your presence here oh, and the, the audience online, the virtual audience, we honor you. So your presence here is a testament to the power of unity and shared purpose. May you depart with minds ablaze with questions that fuel interdisciplinary conversations and reflections. Let us forge connections and transcend this auditorium birthing collaborations that stand as beacons of innovation against the challenges that lie ahead. In bidding adieu to this juncture, let us embark on a journey illuminated by the beacon of Professor Koza Shangase's wisdom. May the spirit of inquiry rooted in the ethos of our surroundings guide our every step. With hearts open to the calling of ethical stewardship let us wield the weapon of knowledge against forces that seek to constrain and diminish. Together we possess the power to etch a new narrative of ear and hearing care, and to craft a legacy that echoes through the corridors of time. Let us not simply commemorate this moment. Let it be the spark that ignites a revolution of consciousness 
steering towards a brighter future. With profound gratitude, I extend my heartfelt thanks to each one of you. Your presence has breathed life into this groundbreaking inaugural lecture, propelling it towards unprecedented success. Thank you, and have a good evening. So on behalf of the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Lynn Morris, I want to just say even good things come to an end and also declare this, uh, these proceedings closed. But I'm inviting all of you as you walk out to have some chocolates. <laughs> cappuccino and you name it please don't go before you finish all the food thank you very much and good evening to you all